Welcome to the Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota podcast. Safe Passage for Children's mission is to ensure that Minnesota has a child welfare system in which children are safe and can reach their full potential. This series of episodes will take a closer look at our short weekly policy blog, or eBrief. If you know someone who cares about children, be sure to share this podcast with them. Stick around for this week's eBrief podcast episode featuring Safe Passage for Children's Executive Director, Rich German. October events to address family violence. At our October 13th and 14th fundraiser and follow-up conference, Andrew Campbell, who's a pioneer in the emerging field of family violence, will explore the interrelationships among animal abuse, domestic violence, and child maltreatment. His holistic approach reveals some attention-grabbing connections. For example, child maltreatment co-occurs in 60% of households where there's domestic violence. Neighbors initiate 89% of animal abuse reports, but only 8% of child maltreatment reports. Animal abuse often comes to light a year earlier than child maltreatment. And domestic violence victims typically report their abuse after 10 incidents, but they delay until 20 or more incidents if they fear that their abuser will harm their pet. These insights suggest combining agencies that respond to these various manifestations of family violence into a single coordinated effort would be a great idea. This could significantly shorten the time to address child maltreatment while at the same time reducing incidents of animal abuse and domestic violence. So to comment on this blog, let me start first by plugging Andrew Campbell's new book called Not Without My Pet. There's a link to it in the blog or you can look it up. Andrew Campbell in this book shares how his dog helped him survive a violent childhood, and it explores the relationship between animal and child abuse. So in commenting on this blog, I want to say that Andrew Campbell, if you haven't seen him, is an energized speaker who has done some pioneering work on the interrelationships among various forms of family violence, which is a term that describes all forms of violence in a household, whether against children, elders, pets, or domestic partners. Hasten to say that this concept isn't new. The Link Coalition, which you might want to look up, has been raising awareness of this for 30 or more years, though they tend to be somewhat weighted towards animal issues. But what Andrew Campbell has brought to the table is these energizing presentations and some fascinating research and the ability to integrate existing research to show the connections between these various forms of family violence and some serious marketing skills, which have enabled him to reach large new audiences. In the year before COVID, for example, he did over 200 presentations in person across the country to a wide variety of groups. You can look on his website, but they included medical interns, local law enforcement people, other first responders, domestic violence advocates, and many others. So first in pulling together some existing research, he's cast a lot of light on the data that starts to help us make connections between forms of violence against family members, including the examples listed in today's blog, such as that maltreatment co-occurs in 60% of households with domestic violence, and that the lion's share of animal abuse reports come from neighbors and passers-by. Typically, those animal abuse reports are responded to without the animal abuse people being aware of or at least able to deal with uh, any other forms of domestic violence and child maltreatment that are going on at the same time. So there's an opportunity missed to address other forms of abuse much earlier. One particular statistic of note is that domestic violence victims tend to delay their reporting their situations if they have a pet, as I said, and that's because the offender often uses the tactic of keeping them under his control, usually his control, by threatening to kill or otherwise harm the animals, and in many cases actually doing so. So in addition to pulling together this research, he has done some of his own new research, and to me, One of the most exciting insights is that he maps hotspots for domestic violence and animal control calls in different communities 
And they show that there is, as I mentioned, about a year's lag time between when animal abuse is reported versus domestic violence. And since we know from the research of him and others that child maltreatment and domestic violence co-occur, as I said, about 60% of the time, the idea that we could often know about domestic violence and child abuse a year earlier obviously raises some great possibilities of dealing with that by integrating the responses of animal control, domestic violence, and child protection agencies. Now, a major stumbling block for realizing this potential is that domestic violence practitioners often strongly believe that a victim should have the ability to initiate the report of intimate partner violence, or IPV as it's currently being called, when they are ready and not because they're forced into it, for example, by a police call, a child maltreatment, or an animal abuse investigation, or some other trigger. Now, this is not my field, domestic violence, but as I understand it, Part of the thinking here is that the victim, usually a woman, has to be committed to escaping an abusive relationship before that break is actually going to stick. So women who leave these relationships, and that's in part because women who leave these relationships usually take huge risks, including economic hardships and the potential for the abuser to track them down and their children and escalate the violence. So it's not an easy decision, no question about that. As always, however, we should ask the question, what about the child? If delaying the domestic violence response means that children will have to endure another year or two of paralyzing fear, crippling emotional abuse, often physical and sexual abuse as well, we ask whether the domestic victim should be the only person to make that decision about when enough is enough. Do children also have rights in these situations? And if so, what laws or agencies are going to stand up and protect them. We might explore whether there's any mediating policy or practice modifications that would give as much consideration as possible to the needs of the domestic violence victim, but at the same time recognize the dilemma the situation places the children in. Perhaps we should have some legislation or practices that put a limit on how long children can be expected to endure such treatment uh, I think that we always need to keep in mind that a child's time frame is not the same as that of an adult. An extra year or two in these circumstances can often make the difference between being able to recover from the maltreatment and go on to lead a normal life, or on the other hand, being able to being unable to escape permanent damage. So that leads to the usual outcomes of drug and alcohol abuse, serious and persistent mental illness, inability to keep a job or a marriage, life in trouble with law enforcement and so forth. Now, in terms of policy, one pinch point here is the child protection criteria for what is called failure to protect, which refers to a maltreatment report against a mother based on her failure to keep children away from dangerous individuals. This can potentially lead to a finding of maltreatment against the mother and sometimes even the loss of custody of her children. So obviously it's pretty serious. As an example, of dealing with this, legislation was recently introduced in Minnesota that proposed to eliminate this failure to prevent, to protect provision in cases of domestic violence. But again, we would point out that mothers and child protection authorities shouldn't be able to decide that children should continue to be victims of violence just because it has adverse effects on the mom. In addition to these factors are the complexities of ever trying to consolidate any public agencies, particularly daunting in this case, first because animal control and child protection agencies tend to be county or in, child, in animal control, sometimes even local departments. And then on top of this, domestic violence organizations aren't usually public agencies, but usually independent nonprofits. So in all likelihood, any attempt to integrate responses by these agencies that deal with family violence would have to be by means other than putting them all together into one, one county or state agency. That said, a lot of progress could be made with com the combination of some enabling legislation and a shift in public and professional attitudes about family violence. Back to Andrew, Andrew Campbell then for a minute. He did a webinar for us last year during COVID that raised a lot of interesting issues that went beyond the pandemic. There's a link to this webinar in our blog in the phrase, a year earlier, or you can find it under events on our website. The title of this webinar is The Impact of COVID-19 on Child Maltreatment. 
So I commend his entire presentation to you. He covers points such as that pets, and especially dogs, can significantly buffer the emotional damage from child abuse and domestic violence, giving the child a better chance of recovering as an adult. And secondly, he points out that every impact of domestic violence gets much worse if there is also a history of animal abuse on the part of the offenders. So the frequency or violence of rape or other forms of physical abuse, assaults and so forth, increases significantly just with the introduction of that one variable. He also points out that the fact that 80% of abuse reports for animals come from neighbors or passers-by, while well, only 8% of child maltreatment reports come from those sources, means that these are two different ways of reporting family violence and that they don't largely overlap. As one result, being able to pick up on one or the other of them will significantly improve the chances of dealing with the situation overall. But in this webinar, I particularly recommend the section starting around minute 54, where he goes over charts showing the hotspots in a particular community for animal control runs and domestic violence. This is where he shows that there's a very strong overlap and also a one-year time lag between the two kinds of reports. So finally, then, I recommend that you mark your calendars for October 13th and 14th when Andrew Campbell will speak in Minnesota. October 13th is our annual fundraiser, which is a breakfast meeting that can be attended in person or virtually. And then on October 14th, which is a Friday, we will have a half-day conference, which will feature Andrew Campbell and breakout sections on some related issues. So I hope to see you there. Well, with that, I want to thank you, Rich, for sharing your time and your expertise on these issues. Again, if you know someone who cares about children, be sure to share this podcast with them. Until next time, this is Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota, working to ensure that Minnesota has a child welfare system in which children are safe and can reach their full potential. If you would like to learn more about Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota, please visit us on our website at safepassageforchildren.org. There you can sign up for our email list, read all of our eBrief blog posts, register for our free bi-monthly webinars, watch our featured videos, and more. You can also follow Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn.